Ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to talk to you this morning. Oh, it doesn't doesn't work. No, does not. I'm on. Now it works. Okay, because yeah, I, I don't have the loudspeakers. It's my great pleasure to address this distinguished audience this morning. I've been uh, roused, especially by the introductory comments of our president this year, who said that all members without sufficient knowledge of economics would be expelled. <laughs> so, good prospects. So this morning we had the first step of economic enlightenment. It will we'll continue a little bit on the, on the same vein with uh, monetary topics. So we learned something about Cantillon effects uh, in verbal, graphical, and arithmetic <laughs> algebraic form. And we will, we will have more about Nobel Prize winners uh, a little later this afternoon. So today we have, uh, the, this is my talk, we have uh, the, the mirage of uh, cheap credit. Of course, we will start with a definition. So uh, credit is a definitive or temporary transfer of an economic good in exchange for a future payment agreed upon in advance. Agreed upon in advance is important because this is what distinguishes a credit from a an investment of your own equity capital, there also you buy an uh, economic resource in exchange as you hope for a future payment, only that this future payment is uh, uncertain, so uh, at, at your own risk. The main forms of credit are loans, commercial credit, mortgage, rent, lease, etc. So it's a phenomenon that is uh, very well known. Uh, before we can uh, talk about uh, cheap credit, so the definition of uh, credit, we need to talk about cheap credit, uh, we uh, should maybe consider some of the main problems uh, that are discussed and uh, that are practical problems also in, the, in, in this field. Uh, first of all, as we, as we know, uh, in our present day, credit is considered to be a panacea. Right? So as soon as there's any, any problem uh, that appears, it's often a lack of uh, sufficient funds, there's always a lack of, of funding. And especially as uh, now in the, in the context of government finance, governments have been called to uh, address the crisis, among other things. Uh, so we need to bail out companies, and of course you need a lot of money to do this. So where does this money come from? You could raise it in the form of taxes. That's unpopular. So we need to raise more money uh, in the form of credit. Credit helps everywhere. Is credit an economic uh, uh, panacea? Uh, what are the limitations of credit? And uh, the, the only uh, limitation that is con uh, often considered is the monetary uh, limitation. Uh, credit has monetary chains. Very famously in the 1920s, Schumpeter said, and we'll talk about Schumpeter later, Schumpeter said that uh, there are golden chains on the credit machine. Right? We could, be, could promote growth uh, ever so much more if only we didn't have gold as uh, a base money. Now today we don't have gold as a base money, we still have money, some money, and uh, credit, uh, if we are extending credit only on the base of the existing money supply, is limited, so we can grant much more credit if we create simply more money, and this is precisely the, the heart of cheap credit, credit coming springing from money production. We have cheap money, money that is created out of thin air, which gives then cheap credit. So clearly then, uh, from an Austrian point of view, we need to distinguish between good credits and bad credits, and this is the, the subject of my talk, to explain a little bit the difference. What, is, what are good credits? What are bad credits? Uh, good credits are essentially those that are coming out of savings. Bad credits are those that are springing out of artificial money production. In contemporary economics, it is of a non-Austrian brand, uh, we wouldn't find any of this. It doesn't give us any clue. First of all, the, um, the empirical evidence already is uh, inconclusive. Uh, essentially, uh, contemporary economics tries to find, uh, develop very uh, models. So there's no real in-depth uh, analysis of uh, phenomena. So we have a, a quick model of an uh, algebraic form. Very often, then, you try to uh, verify this model with the help of the data. And in the data, actually, this is something that's very interesting. We, we don't find any strong confirmation of the connection between uh, credit and uh, growth. There's even not a very strong connection between the growth of financial markets and growth. And of course, there is a correlation, but as far as causality is concerned, there's no strong evidence. It's an amazing fact. Uh, and uh, so what we know is that financial markets grow and even tend to grow 
overproportionately when the rest of the economy grows, and, but we uh, don't see any causal connection. We don't know whether it's more useful to have a bank-based financial system or market-based financial system. Um, and uh, so we have an empirical record that is by and large inconclusive. And the, the, as I will argue, one of the reasons why we have this inconclusiveness, which is surprising, uh, is uh, that we don't make the right distinctions. All the econometric work that is currently being conducted is based on uh, aggregate variables, which um, uh, so we have a volume of credit, volume of uh, bank loans, we have uh, balance sheet volumes and so on. We try to correlate this with economic growth. So we have aggregate categories that are fit for uh, quantitative work, but which are not really relevant from an Austrian point of view. What we need is a distinction between good credits and bad credits. But the distinctions that we do make, uh, what we do find in contemporary economics, are commercial rather than economic distinctions. So we have different types of credits, different types of financial instruments. But uh, that's not really what we are after from an Aust Austrian point of view. One example would be bank credit. So we have this large category bank credit. But bank credit can be given on the basis of uh, a pure, in the form of a pure financial intermediation. In this case, the bank lends out money that it has received from other people. But bank credit, the same bank credit, can also be granted on the basis of money creation, which is completely different. So in the, the statistics, we have this one category. We don't have the, uh, the distinction that is interesting or seems to be important from an Austrian point of view. So if we had this, would be, so this would be an interesting question which we'll answer in the future maybe. If we had such a statistics, probably they would uh, show the results that we expect from an Austrian point of view. So, uh, in, in the light of contemporary knowledge, we cannot make the distinction between good finance and bad finance. So we have all uh, the bad guys are protected under the uh, shield of ignorance. And we have all the good guys uh, thrown into uh, one uh, bathtub with, with the bad guys and so silently suffering like, uh, like Scrooge. So what we'll do now is to uh, run very quickly through credit in the history of economic thought and I will stay there only for five minutes or so and then turn to two to three crucial questions. The, the first one is why can credit be productive in the first place? Why can it ever be productive? So what are the theoretical reasons that lead us to believe that credit can be productive. And then we'll uh, answer the question, when actually is credit be productive? Well, the first one is, when can it be productive? Under which circumstances can it be productive? And when is it, or ten, does it tend to be productive? And then finally, we get to fiat credit, which is the, the cheap credit that we are mostly interested in. OK, so question the history, credit in the history of economic thought, we have uh, three main phases. The first one is we have here bad old times. Uh, cheap ideas about money and credit have been uh, old uh, and uh, so it has been one of the, the most widespread ideas. I mean, you always need to consider that uh, popular thought about money and uh, uh, banking issues is known only as from the 1500s approximately, simply because we didn't have printing press before. And so, I mean, certainly these ideas are much, much older, but as from the 1500s, right, we, we found these traces that, I mean, uh, the economy is not running well, or business is uh, sluggish because there's not, much, not enough money around, right? So, uh, and we need to, can repair this if we had more, more money around, could, more money could be created uh, through banks. And these cheap ideas, so were, were popular, they uh, 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 were fundamental or lend support to cheap money schemes, creation of uh, fractional reserve banks, starting in particular in the 17th century, that produced uh, cheap money. And as we have learned from Olivier Rochard this morning, so cheap money for some, at the first circle people, the second circle, the third circle people, and huge bills to pay for others, right? because there's an expropriation scheme going on. The first uh, users are benefited at the expense of later users. And of course, as we also know, and as we'll explain a little bit later, such schemes lead invariably to crises. So there are bills to pay in one form or another by others. Uh, the most famous cheap uh, 
idea pro producer was John Law. John Law is actually a mixed case. John Law was a, a Scottish financial promoter. Uh, and this is this is his uh, portrait here, one of the portraits. Uh, and Olivier Richard mentioned him too, right? So he's a great antagonist of Richard Cantillon in the early 1700s. And uh, also the author of uh, one of the first treatises on, on money, um, in which he explained that economic growth could be produced by simply producing more money. Uh, cheap money was used in uh, uh, the financing of colonial adventures, so the Mississippi bubble, and was uh, John Law's responsibility, but also in the US uh, themselves, the British colonies, they, they used uh, cheap money, they used paper money all throughout the 18th, 18th century, and cheap money invariably led in one form or the other to revolutions. It financed the American Revolution and it financed also the wars of the French revolutionaries against the rest of uh, Europe. Then came phase two, the revolution. In this case, a revolution, the old sense, it's a return, re revolver, as a return to, uh, to bring ideas and practice into conformity with uh, the real world. So we have here sound ideas, or at least sounder ideas than before. Sound money for everybody. The most striking case is the American Revolution, which cut uh, the history of uh, American monetary history in two before we had paper money regimes, and the American Revolution brings commodity money and ends uh, paper money experiences. So we have sound money for all. We have relatively small bills to pay, also about all. The most important uh, theoreticians here, uh, as far as uh, credit and, and capital, the role of capital is uh, concerned, are uh, Turgo, uh, Adam Smith, uh, Ricardo. This is the, the picture here is from Ricardo. And Ricardo, especially through his monetary writings, was the most sophisticated classical economist and also had a major impact on the Bullion Report, which denounced the uh, uh, money creation by the Bank of England for rising prices uh, in the, the first decade of the 19th century. You see here that I put Adam Smith uh, one, right? because Adam Smith, as far as money is concerned, has two faces. It's the good Adam Smith, is this one, Adam Smith one. And there's the bad Adam Smith. And the good Adam Smith says that money has no, uh, nothing to do with economic growth at all. The real causes of economic growth are capital accumulation and the division of labor. And then, of course, technological change that goes in with it. But money has nothing to do with this. The economy can grow at whatever price level, whatever spending level. And then there's Adam Smith too, who is the Adam Smith of the real builds doctrine. So according to Adam Smith, it's, it's kind of okay and even beneficial if you extend the money supply in such a way as to uh, grant credit only for goods that are ready to be sold. So these are the so-called real bills. So we get then to the to phase three, which is the counter-revolution. We have cheap ideas again. Ideas never die; they just have different protagonists. Here we have uh, Silvio Gesell. This is his portrait. It's a German-Argentinian uh, businessman and a financial promoter, so his idea was, that, again, right, to growth requires more money and uh, we need to uh, incite people to spend the money rather than hoard it, and so we need to have uh, uh, something that he calls a Schwundgeld, so sh uh, money of a shrinking value substance, money that should be taxed at a regular rate so that people have an incentive to spend it rather than pay the tax later on. Adam Smith too is part of this, the so-called banking school, which uh, develops uh, the ideas of Adam Smith uh, further. And uh, most notably, uh, another Scottish uh, theorist, the Scots have, uh, even though Scotland was a rather poor country, one of, maybe one of the reasons why they were fantasizing uh, about the, the om omnipotence of money in creating more wealth. So we have another Scot, uh, MacLeod, uh, was the most inf influential uh, banking theorist of his time and whose idea holds sway still over the present day. So we achieve ideas again, cheap money again for some, and huge growth to pay for others. Phase four then, we have consolidation, consolidation of uh, the counter-revolution, which is uh, our day. And there's one uh, interesting aspect of this uh, consolidation in me that uh, it's rather technical. 
uh, in nature, so ideas are pushed in the background, nobody talks about uh, Cantillon effects anymore. And, uh, uh, so there are endless streams of money and a great but hidden robbery uh, engineered especially through central banks. So let's turn then to the, the first central question, why can credit be productive? The first thing to keep in mind is that credit is always a transfer of resources. Credit does not create resources. Even if credit is granted out of nothing, through money creation, it's just a transfer of a resource from one end of the economy to another. It's creation, in this case, of purchasing power, which permits some people to buy resources, but you can buy only what is already there. And so credit always is transfer. It doesn't create resources. So the question is, do we have here a zero-sum game, which apparently it is, or are there reasons for which this could be a positive-sum game, or are there other reasons for which there are negatives? It is a negative-sum game. So the, the, the aggregate impact is uh, superior or negative. And what I will argue is that in the case of sound credit, credit coming out of savings, credit can be a positive sum game for various reasons. And in the case of uh, fiat credit, cheap credit, it tends to be a negative sum game. So classical explanations, this is to go. Classical explanations, why credit can be productive. It transfers resources to more competent agents. It allows for the realization of larger projects that would have been impossible to realize with uh, the capital or the savings available to any individual capitalist. It allows for a division of labor, in particular between savers and investors. So it allows for a division of labor between capital-rich savers, but who are not particularly savvy investors, right? uh, good at specialists in le leading a frugal life, right? the French peasant, and then you have investors who are maybe not particularly good at leading a frugal life, but who are good investors. So there's a possible division of labor between these two species. And we have here absolute, the case of absolute advantages as in the theory of division of labor in general and the case of comparative advantages. That is, such a division of labor is possible even if you have one guy who is frugal, is a, a saver, uh, then, even then the other guys to whom he lends money, but he has so much money that he cannot invest it all on his own. Just, just doesn't have the, the time uh, resources to monitor all this investment so he uh, lends to other people. And we have a division of capital which is already an uh, Austrian contribution by Ludwig von Lachmann for the same reason as the division of labor creates uh, aggregate benefits, the division of capital, different uh, use of um, uh, savings to create different capital goods creates an aggregate uh, positive impact. In contemporary economics, uh, we have two distinct uh, strands of additional explanation. It's not something that abrogates classical economics, but that adds on to it. Uh, the first one uh, stresses the stabilization of consumption through time. So credit allows us to, stabilize, to smooth out our consumption through time. So it's not necessary that we uh, reshuffle, so to say, the, the structure of production in our, uh, our uh, own uh, lifestyle in the course of, uh, depending on um, uh, the fluctuation of our revenue, but we can smooth it out on time and therefore obtain some gains. Well, most notably in contemporary economics, we have a huge uh, emphasis on agency theory. So it's a the distinction between the principal and an agent. The principal would be the saver, the saver capitalist, and then the, agent, the principal has agents, which can be agents to court or can be financial agents. An agent uh, could, for, would, uh, non-financial agent would, for example, be um, the management of a corporation. And so you have uh, CEOs and so on, which are employees, which are not capitalists themselves, but who are agents of the uh, property owners of the company, but are not financial agents. On the other hand, uh, we have financial agents, which are banks, insurance companies, investment funds, and so on which are intermediaries between the principals, so the savers, and uh, the, the final users of, of these savings, so the companies that invest them in industrial production, for example. So we have here a division of financial labor, uh, which concerns most notably product innovation. We have specialists creating ever more financial products. 
which is a short list of the main fields where we have such product uh, innovation, uh, the creation of risk and the return packages, so portfolio creation, uh, then the portfolio management, uh, port maturity transformation, so for example, lending, uh, borrowing short, lending long, or the other way around, which is a little bit less frequent, uh, borrow long, lend short, so that's all co conceivable. And then risk transformation, I right, know, was not uh, notably in the case of securitization. I mean, this is all of, uh, financial sharabia, so I, I won't go into details. So there is product uh, innovation, that's what we need to keep in mind. Then we have uh, risk management uh, and uh, monitoring, right? So you have uh, companies managing uh, risk, uh, which also occurs in the, in the context of portfolio management. And uh, we have the monitoring of investments on behalf of the, of the clients, of the principals. So most of, if you give, for example, uh, your money to uh, you invest your pension funds into a pension fund company, then the pension fund management monitors the companies to which it has lent money. And sometimes things turn out good, and sometimes not so good. Like here, this is on the Dubai Stock Exchange. As is also, he's monitoring his investments, and it <laughs> turns out to be not so good. There's one case that is particularly interesting, uh, that is commercial credit. Because commercial credit is a borderline case, uh, very close to, uh, so there is money creation involved here, but so we need to distinguish between a good variant and a bad variant. Uh, so commercial, uh, commercial credit uh, not only exists in the form of advanced payments. You ex expect a delivery from a company, your own company needs a delivery of some machine or some tool or whatever, and you pay in advance. You pay a sum of money in advance and you obtain an IOU. So uh, uh, a slip of paper that says, that, well, I owe you a delivery of these and that goods. So uh, in this case, we, uh, why do we make an advance payment? Because uh, as a rule, uh, this is cheaper than uh, to make uh, the, the payment later. Uh, and uh, we can use the bills of exchange that we buy in this way for purchases. So we have uh, additional liquidity if the, uh, the issuer of this bill of exchange uh, has a good reputation. So this is a sort of credit money. So we need less ba ca uh, cash balances and can therefore invest more capital uh, out of our uh, capital, not in cash balances but in other things, and therefore we obtain a higher return on investment. The same thing works in the other direction. If we have an advanced delivery, we deliver it in advance. We expect we are not paid right now on the spot, but we are prom obtain a promise uh, for payment in three months or so, which is typical practice. So here we have a higher revenue because we could have sold our commodity, of course, too. Right? We could have delivered and insisted on immediate payment. Only then we would have obtained a lower price. So we have a higher revenue. And we can again use the bills of exchange for purchases. So we have again credit money creation, the same thing, so a higher return on investment. Now the crucial question is, do we have here just individual or aggregate benefits? Clearly, I mean, they're individual benefits. The companies practicing the, uh, these things are benefiting from it. How does the same thing look like from an aggregate point of view? Uh, clearly, uh, the, the fact that credit, credit money is being created is irrelevant from an aggregate point of view. As a consequence of the credit money creation, the price level tends to be higher, spending streams tend to be higher, monetary revenues tend to be higher. But that is, as Adam Smith has explained, irrelevant, uh, and as the Austrians confirm, is irrelevant from an aggregate point of view. Moreover, we have, uh, so here, additional investments, right, the, the benefiting company can, uh, can invest uh, more, but they are crowding out other resource uses. So this is not an aggregate benefit either. But we do find an aggregate benefit because we have here a compliance mechanism. That is, uh, you can benefit from commercial credit only if you have a good reputation. Otherwise, people would always insist that you pay right now. So commercial credit creates benefits for people who have good morals, uh, who are good at uh, keeping contracts. Uh, commercial credit and uh, the, commodity, the uh, credit money that it creates is a reliability premium which diminishes agency problems and therefore creates some aggregate benefit. And this then gives us a possible feedback mechanism in which credit can uh, 
uh, sort of summary, right, can for various reasons uh, create a better use of resources. So this is the essential mechanism. Right? Credit is always a transfer of resource, uh, resources. It doesn't create resources. But it can improve things from an aggregate point of view because it can facilitate a better use of the existing resources. And to this extent, then we obtain a higher return on investment in business and we obtain higher real incomes because the use of the uh, available resources is better, so more products are being created. And if there are higher real incomes, then there can be more savings and more savings can therefore facilitate more credit and so on. Right? So we have a uh, loop. Now the question is when, so these are various questions, various scenarios for why credit can be productive, right, from an aggregate point of view. When is it productive? In order to understand this, we need to first consider the limits of credit. First of all, there's time preference, uh, which this, uh, determines how much money people save and how much money they spend immediately for consumer goods. So this is the limitation for credit. Credit necessarily comes out of savings in the scenario that we are considering now. Uh, and so time preference provides an upper limit. The quality of entrepreneurial judgment, do we uh, actually, uh, we had the first scenario as a transfer to more competent agents. Are they more competent? Uh, that's, a, that's a big question. Right? We, we think, we hope, but we don't know. Uh, and then there are risks, right? Market risks, political risks. If risks increase, interest rates tend to increase because there's a risk premium in the interest rates or credits uh, diminish. It's a limitation on credit. And then, of course, agency problems. Can we trust the people to whom we transfer our money. And then finally, which is related to agency problems, uh, the preference for independence. And we Sometimes we just don't want to have credit. We want to operate with our own money. We don't want to be dependent on bankers or any other person who has lent us money. We want to be our own man. Like Scrooge. It's, it's, so this, is, this is a French Scrooge. He says, uh, come in. <laughs> Not waiting for his bank but probably for some people who want to lend money from him. Okay, so when is credit productive? The Austrian explanation has been given, the essential explanation has been given by Ludwig von Mises, who argued that uh, credit uh, is productive uh, when it is uh, granted in a competitive process. Mises discuss, discussed this uh, in the context of his discussion of cheap credit. He said, why would we need money creation to provide additional credits. If the investment that we want to finance with this cheap credit is really more important, that is, is more profitable than the other investments that need the same resources, well, then the investor could simply pay higher interest rates. So he could bid available savings away from the other people. There would be no need to facilitate this investment by money creation. So in the economy, you have always, uh, in the best of all cases, the market economy, all available resources would be affected to the uh, investments that earn the highest return. Because the highest return is validated, so to say, by consumer expenditure. So the higher return, therefore, the, uh, the more the, the products are being valued by consumers. So we wish that all resources are being effect affected to the uh, employments that obtain the highest return. In such a context, it's never a difficulty to obtain credit if your investment project is more important from the point of view of consumers than the other investment projects, then you can pay higher interest rates because you earn more. Right? So you can always obtain credit. It's only if, you, if your investment project obtains lower returns than the other projects that you need a subsidy coming in the form of cheap credit. But then clearly you are benefiting at the expense of all others who could have used the same resources that you are buying. So this is Mises' argument. And this argument clearly is based on uh, uh, a definition of property rights, right? because the competitive bidding presupposes property, and uh, uh, property must be legitimate, so it must spring from appropriate appropriation mechanisms, which brings us from Mises to somebody we know, <laughs> and who has stressed the mechanisms of uh, moral appropriation, namely self-ownership, homesteading, production, gifts, and exchange. Now we come to fiat credit. Fiat credit is a temporary transfer of money created through violations of property rights 
in exchange for a future payment agreed upon in advance. So the crucial thing here is, of course, then the violations of property rights. The main forms are bank loans out of fiduciary media, so fractional reserve banking, and all central bank issues. And here we have then the multi-trillion dollar question, does fiat credit convey any aggregate benefits? <laughs> Is it a positive sum game? We have here Schumpeter gave us an intellectual answer to the question. Schumpeter said that regular savings only mean stagnation. It just, they just reproduce always the same structure of production. And only fiat credit is productive. That's what we could also call the Rambo answer in favor of fiat money. Uh, the, the most widespread answer is the theory of idle resources, which says that we have idle cash balances that can be suitably uh, lent out by banks. Uh, we have uh, labor, unemployed labor, and other unemployed resources, which can be mobilized by uh, more spending. But these, uh, this answer is wrong, right? Because uh, resources are, strictly speaking, never idle, right? They are not presently used for reasons. In particular, the, the, the payment that is being proposed is too low from the point of view, from the standpoint of the present owners. Now, if we simply create more money uh, to pay higher prices for them, then uh, the purchasing power of the money is lower. So we're not, not really offering a higher real payment, but uh, uh, the, the lower, the same real payment. Uh, idle uh, cash is uh, not detrimental from an aggregate point of view. Some Austrian economists have even praised uh, cash hoarders, the misers, right? Walter Block, for example, in his book, Defending the Undefendables, uh, praised the miser, right? Because if you're hoarding cash, it means that you exercise a pressure on all prices to fall. Right? There's less money in circulation, so prices tend to fall, which means that the purchasing power of the money used by all other people increases. Right? So still all resources can be bought, uh, but uh, only at lower prices. So uh, the, the theory of idle resources leads then to an economic policy built on illusions and deceit, and uh, this is ultimately self-defeating. Then we have a few rather cheap answers, which I cannot fully address because I'm running out of time. Right? Uh, cheap, uh, cheap money, cheap credit doesn't facilitate uh, sales. Right? It simply allows for sales at higher uh, money uh, prices, uh, but, of course, again, at the expense of other people, right? We are benefiting some at the expense uh, of others. Uh, we can save money or maybe get rid of money altogether. We can promote innovation. This is Schumpeter's uh, answer. And we can stabilize aggregate spending, uh, which would be the answer given by George Selgin and Lawrence White in our day. So what's the Austrian take on, fiduciary, uh, on, on the multi-trillion dollar question? The Austrians, first of all, stress that any money supply is equally good or optimal, and that fiat credit does not increase wealth. Uh, but crowds are genuine savings, and because uh, time preference uh, tends to uh, grow up. It benefits always some at the expense of others, so the Cantillon effect. And it entails economic crises, which have been de described by the Austrian business cycle theory. And it entails in the intervention spirals, and the problems that we create through fiat credit uh, always provide a pretext for more government interventions. So fiat credit does not solve any uh, credit-related problems. It does not diminish the risks that we face in the economy, neither market risks nor political risks. Uh, it doesn't diminish agency problems. It uh, does not improve entrepreneurial qualities. It destroys genuine trust in credit right, because credit is cheap. So we don't need to pay that close attention to whom we are lending our money. So trust and true credit uh, do not count that much. It creates incentives for business practices that fragilize banks and the financial industries. The unlimited availability, availability of credit, uh, coming from, from central banks in particular, creates incentives for banks to diminish their uh, equity capital, right, go into more debt, uh, diminish uh, liquidity, and seek uh, more risky investments. So and this is a, is a poisonous cocktail that uh, then leads to financial crisis and then gives an, a pretext for more interventions, as we witness right now, uh, with governments regulating the financial industries a little more. And as we also observe right now, fiat credit facilitates spiraling debt, not only in the Greek case, but in other cases too, that ends up either in hyperinflation or in total government control. So. 
In conclusion, uh, credit tends to have aggregate benefit, benefits if it is created competitively and based on property rights, and if these property rights are originating in self-ownership and homesteading, that is, are sound property rights. It, uh, on the other hand, fiat credit tends to lack any overall beneficial effects. It is just a redistribution uh, tool that allows some to enrich themselves at the expense of other market participants. And uh, it has various uh, harmful consequences from an overall point of view. It fragilizes the financial industries, makes, makes them more vulnerable to, to any sort of shortage of resources. It can create it inside entrepreneurs to invest in too many investment projects that cannot be possibly uh, all realized with the available uh, quantities uh, of uh, real resources. So this was my, uh, my distinction between uh, uh, credit, sound credit, and, and, and fiat credit. And I thank you for your attention.